Thank you for joining us live today here on Love and Money Secrets TV. We are going to be reviewing here Becoming Supernatural, Chapter 6. And uh, Victoria, you are you're on the East Coast. Whereabouts exactly are you? Midwest, Indiana. I want to share with you guys the lyrics to a particular song called The Breakup Song. And I just shared this briefly yesterday, but I want to go ahead and share it again with you guys today. So, and I think it's so appropriate after, I'll put the link to the song so that you guys can listen to it uh, after we're done with this broadcast. The music is fantastic, but the lyrics are so appropriate for what we're going through at this point in time. Uh, the song is just a couple a couple years old, and I think it is phenomenal. So let me go ahead and read those to you. It says here, sick and tired of being sick and tired, had as much of you as I can take. I'm so done, so over being afraid. I've gone through the motions. I've been back and forth. I know that you're thinking, you've heard this before. I don't know how to say it, so I'm just going to say it. Yeah. Fear, you don't own me. There ain't no room in this story. And I ain't got time for you telling me what I'm not. Like, you know me? Well, guess what? I know who I am. I know I'm strong. And I am free. Got my own identity. So fear, you will never be welcome here. Take a minute. Let it settle in. You probably never saw it coming. Something's got to give, so I give up you. Oh, there's no room for you here. Yeah, I've had enough. The no vacancy sign in my heart is lit up. In case you didn't hear it, here it is again. Oh, fear you don't own me. There ain't no room in this story. And I ain't got time for you telling me what I'm not. Like you know me? Well, guess what? I know who I am. I know I'm strong. And I am free. Got my own identity. So fear you will never be welcome here. Is there anybody out there just like me? Anybody needing fear to leave? If you don't know how to say it, sing along with me. Sing fear, you don't own me. There ain't no room in this story. And I ain't got time for you telling me what I am not. Like you know me? Well, guess what? I know who I am. I know I'm strong, brave, and I am free. Got my own identity. So fear, you will never be welcome here. Whoa, goodbye, goodbye fear. Whoa, you will never be welcome here. So I think it's a perfect uh, song to segue to our chapter six. You're going to do a brief little singing bowl to start off with just to get ourselves into the vibe. So over the years, I found that stories serve a great purpose to reinforce information in practical manner. Hearing about someone, someone else's experience makes it more real for us. Once we can relate to the challenges and triumphs a person has along their journey from one state of consciousness to another, we start to believe a similar experience can happen for us. Stories also make the ideas from the teachings become less philosophical and more personal. The case studies that you are about to read concern rooms. Then they applied it and experienced it in their bodies. And finally, they turned it into wisdom in their souls. So for these students to accomplish such supernatural changes, they ultimately had to master some aspect or limitation in themselves. And if they could do it, so can you. So Ginny heals her chronic back and leg pain. So on December 9th of 2013, Jenny was driving on the highway in Las Vegas when her car was hit from behind. 
Even though she slammed on the brakes, the impact catapulted her car into the car in front of her, resulting in a double impact. So she immediately felt a burning sensation in her lower back as pain shot down her right leg. When the paramedics arrived, she described her pain as moderate. But over the next few days, the pain increased until it was constant and severe. Most of her pain was in her lower lumbar spine caused by two herniated discs, L4 and L5. She also felt pain radiating all the way down her right leg to her foot. Jenny saw a chiropractor three times a week, but the pain worsened. She then saw a pain management doctor who prescribed muscle relaxants, Neurontin, a nerve pain medication, and Mobic, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. After nine months, the pain was still so intense, so she had injections in her back, but they didn't help. So as a result, Ginny had difficulty walking and found driving almost impossible. She also had trouble sleeping, managing to get only four or five hours a night. The constant pain in her lower back became worse when she was sitting, lifting something, or standing for long periods of time. Sometimes she could sit for only 20 minutes at a time because, because of all of this, she spent most of her days in bed where she was able to find a little relief when lying on her right side with her knees bent. So Jenny was unable to care for her two children, ages three and five, and she was also unable to work as much as she had before. She depended on her husband to drive her places since she could no longer drive herself. So all of these factors created serious financial problems and emotional stress for the whole family. So Ginny became depressed and angry at life. Although she had attended her first workshop with me before the accident and had been doing her meditations. After the accident, she stopped meditating regularly because the pain got too severe and she said she couldn't sit or concentrate. So after two years, her doctor suggested lumbar surgery to repair the herniated discs. If that didn't work, he said, Ginny could consider additional surgery, including spinal fusion. She decided to go ahead with the initial surgery. So in the meantime, Ginny's husband convinced her to attend another one of my advanced seminars in Seattle, Washington, which started just one week before her surgery date. So staying seated for the flight was so painful, but she made it. And while Ginny enjoyed seeing her old friends and meeting new ones at the event, she also felt saddened and frustrated because she couldn't muster the same enthusiasm yeah. as everybody else had. She just wanted to take some painkillers and go to bed. So when she was leaving the first night's gathering, her good friend, Jill, filled with compassion and hope, said with conviction, Ginny, you will be healed tomorrow, right here. We started the next day at 6 a.m. Ginny decided to avoid taking any heavy medication so she could be present in the meditations and enjoy the experience. Unfortunately, her pain made it very difficult to focus during the first meditation and she wondered if the decision to attend had been just a big mistake. So during the second meditation, after breakfast though, things really shifted. Ginny decided to surrender and leave all her judgment behind. The meditation began as usual with the breathing exercise of pulling the mind out of the body, which during which I told the participants to focus on two or three negative emotions or limited aspects of their personality. So I asked them to move all that stored energy from the first three energy centers up from the base of their spine all the way up to their brain and eventually release it out of the top of their heads. First, Ginny chose to work with anger, which she believed had been a contributing factor in keeping her body in so much pain. So during the meditation, she felt energy starting to move up, up her spine, and then sensed an intense energy leading her body through the back of her head. The second thing she picked to work with was her pain. So as she worked with the breath to move much of the energy related to her pain from her body to her brain, 
she felt the same energy she had when she was working with it, anger. Although this time she saw the energy become a bright color with purple overtones. Suddenly, she sensed the energy slow down and become less intense. The music changed and the main part of the meditation began. Ginny was feeling completely relaxed. She had liberated that energy out of her body. So as usual, I guide the group to feel different parts of their body in space and to sense the space around their bodies. Then I guided them to the infinite black space that is the quantum field. I asked them to become nobody, no one, nowhere, in no time and no thing, and to become pure awareness, aware that they are aware in the endless vast space. At first, as I gave the instructions, Ginny had the distinct sense that she was floating. An intense sense of peace came over her and unconditional love overtook her and she lost track of time and space. She didn't feel her physical body at all, nor did she feel any pain, yet she was fully present and could hear and follow all the instructions I was giving. I never experienced anything like that before, she told me later. It was so profound that it's difficult to put into words. My senses were magnified and I felt connected to everybody, everyone, everything, every place, and every time. I was part of the whole and the whole was part of me. There was no separation. Ginny got beyond her body, her environment and her time, her consciousness had connected to the consciousness of the unified field, the place she described where there's only wholeness and there's no separation. She had found that sweet spot of the generous present moment and her autonomic nervous system stepped in and did the healing for her. So in our advanced workshops, our students lie down after every meditation and surrender in order to allow the autonomic nervous system to take over and program their bodies. So at the end of the meditation, when I asked everyone to come back to their new bodies, Ginny was surprised to discover that she felt absolutely no pain as she got up from the floor to stand. And a process that she normally would have needed help with, she started walking without limping and her back was straight. We broke for lunch, but Ginny didn't feel like eating much or even talking a lot. She was still overwhelmed with the meditation experience. After two years of near constant pain, it felt so freeing to be without it anymore. She started crying tears of joy and confusion simultaneously. She looked for two of her friends to share the good news, including Jill, who had been so sure the night before that Ginny would be healed. They encouraged Ginny to try movements that she hadn't been able to do before when she was in pain. And she performed all of them without any pain at all. So as the day continued, Ginny's pain stayed away. She continued to feel connected to the unified field. That evening, Ginny called her husband, who told her that somehow he just knew she'd be able to heal her pain at this workshop. She had a great dinner with her friends, and when she went to bed, she didn't take any of her pain meds or muscle relaxers. She slept through the night for the very first time in years, waking up filled with energy. So the next day, I guided the group in a walking meditation, which you will read about and have a chance to try later. Ginny was able to walk straight and tall with no pain or difficulty. Difficulty. So needless to say, she canceled the surgery and she, she's remained pain-free. Daniel deals with electromagnetic hypersensitivity. So about five years ago, Daniel 
Daniel was, as he put it, a crazy, stressed out Israeli entrepreneur in his mid twenties who pushed himself daily to work at full power all the way to build a successful business. Working 60 hour weeks was typical for him. So one day while he was raging and yelling at the top of his lungs at a client over the phone, he felt something pop on the right side of his head and he lost consciousness. When he woke up, he wasn't sure what had happened or how long he had been out, but he had the worst headache of his life. He hoped resting would help it go away, but it didn't. Mysteriously, his pain increased exponentially whenever he was near anything that emitted electromagnetic frequencies, including cell phones, laptops, video displays, microphones, cameras, Wi-Fi networks, and cell towers. If someone near him answered a cell phone, Daniel felt it. He'd never experienced anything like this. In fact, he had previously worked in the computer field and never felt ill effects from being around electronic equipment of any kind. So Daniel saw several different doctors and specialists, but none of them could find anything wrong with him. He went through an extensive battery of blood tests, brain scans, physical examinations, but every one of the studies came back negative. Some of the doctors didn't believe him and even became condescending, rolling their eyes as if Daniel were making up his symptoms. Some wanted to give him antidepressants, but he wouldn't take them. They told him his pain was all in his head, which of course it was not, but not in the way, actually, which of course it actually was, but not in the way the doctors actually meant it. So then Daniel started seeing holistic doctors who suspected he had developed a rare condition called electromagnetic hypersensitivity, EHS. Now, while the existence of EHS is still controversial in the medical community, the World Health Organization recognizes the condition. The mechanism of EHS remains unknown, but when you consider that the brain is 78% water, and that water contains minerals, such as those commonly found in the body, including calcium and magnesium, and those conduct electricity, you can see that for EHS sensitive people, that natural electromagnetic charge might somehow become amplified around things that signal and emit electromagnetic radiation. So like many others, with EHS, Daniel also experienced chronic pain and fatigue in addition to his headaches. He'd sleep for 12 hours and still wake up exhausted. So one of the holistic doc doctors suggested he take 40 nutritional supplements a day just to combat the ill effects, but the supplements didn't help. He was still in near constant agony. So before long, Daniel had to choose to close his business. He went into debt and lost everything. He had worked so hard to acquire. So finally he declared bankruptcy and had to move in with his mother. I basically retreated from life. He told me I was a zombie because I couldn't think I couldn't focus. I couldn't do anything. Nothing I did helped. And whenever I got anywhere near the real world, I got a real strong headache. In fact, Daniel told me that if he was ever near anything that emitted a signal, his headaches would be a thousand times worse to the point that he would emotionally break down. Daniel spent most of his time curled up in a ball in his bed, in his tiny room, in his mother's house, crying from pain. I was wasting my life, he said watching all my friends get married, have children, get promoted, buy houses, everything. When he began to feel suicidal, his friends and family pushed him to try to find something that would help him. Now, because of the chronic fatigue, the depression and severe pain, Daniel had only about half an hour of energy each day. So he started to use that little bit of time to find something that might help his condition. 
So three years after the symptoms began, he read my book, You Are the Placebo. Something clicked and he told me, when I met him in a workshop I gave him recently, he said, I knew this was the solution. So he started doing the changing beliefs and perceptions meditation. I talk about it in the book. So very gradually, over time, Daniel felt a little less pain. So he kept on doing the meditations. And after a while, he discovered my blessing of the energy centers meditation. And he started doing that. So for the very first time I, I did it, Daniel told me, something happened that I didn't know how to explain. When he got to the sixth energy center, which is you know your pineal gland, he said it was like a light show was going on inside his head. He saw different areas of the brain that had been shut down suddenly start to light up and communicating with each other. Then a huge beam of what he described as loving light shot out through the top of his head. His inward experience in that moment was more real than the memory of the past experience which had created the pain in the first place. So from that point on, Daniel noticed a significant change. So after meditating, he would have 10 minutes without any pain at all. The pain-free periods kept getting longer and longer until a few months later, he was completely pain-free. Then he got the idea that he should use the meditations to change his internal state while he was exposed to the electromagnetic fields that had been making him so sick. So he started meditating in front of his cell phone and laptop. It was painful at first, but just as before, he'd eventually feel free of pain after meditating. And then those pain-free periods kept getting longer as time wore on. So finally, Daniel was ready to take another big step. He hired a desk in a shared office space and decided to just sit there and meditate and meditate surrounded by Wi-Fi, computers, microwaves, and all sorts of electromagnetic frequencies. So although the first few weeks were difficult, he found that it became easier as time wore on. After a while, he was meditating in that environment without pain for five hours a day. So eventually his headaches had just disappeared. And so did all his chronic pain and fatigue. So today, Daniel considers himself 100% healed. He went back to work and got out of debt. And here's the kicker. Daniel works only about one to up from an hour to an hour and a half a day. And he's making way more money than he was when he was stressed out and trying to force his life into working the way he wanted to. He's also truly enjoying life. Isn't that beautiful? Jennifer, in sickness and in health. So five years ago, Jennifer's doctor diagnosed her with several new illnesses in addition to the numerous other health conditions she already suffered from. So in total, her diagnosis included a few autoimmune disorders such as lupus, erythematosus, and Sjogren's syndrome with Sika complex, some gastrointestinal disorders, celiac disease, salicylate intolerance, and lactose intolerance, chronic asthma, kidney disease, arthritis, and vertigo so acute it often resulted in vomiting. So every day was a struggle. Even just brushing her teeth was difficult because she lacked enough strength to hold her arm up for very long. Her partner, Jim, often had to brush her hair for her. When Jim was away on business, which was often, Jennifer had to take a nap after work so she could have enough strength to cook dinner. 
the hardest thing was that I felt like a terrible mother because I couldn't do anything with my boys and that broke my heart, she told me. I would have to sleep most of the weekend just to be able to get up to go to work on Monday morning and all the happy pictures I posted on Facebook during the weekend were captured in about one hour. So by this point, Jennifer weighed only 108 pounds and struggled to walk due to arthritis and severe swelling in her ankles and her knees. She could no longer use her right hand to open containers or cut vegetables because of the pain and the arthritis. At times she would lie in bed and hit her arms against her night table to stop the pain. Her body was in a constant state of acute inflammation and even the specialist she saw said they couldn't do anything for her and that she had to learn to live with all her conditions as best she could. So although she never admitted to it or to anyone, she feared she might only have a few years left to live. So she may have been ready to give up, but Jim wasn't. So every night, Jim devoured books, looking for alternative solutions, repeatedly encouraging Jennifer to keep going. Then Jim found You Are the Placebo and read about a woman with a similar condition who was able to heal herself. So Jennifer and Jim agreed that she had to go to a workshop. So just two months later, in June of 2014, Jennifer attended a weekend workshop in Sydney, Australia. She started to feel a little bit better and registered for an advanced workshop in Mexico. Unfortunately, around the time she was scheduled to leave for the workshop, she developed an 8.5 millimeter kidney stone and her doctor refused to let her fly. So she missed it. But she kept doing her meditations, getting up at 4.50 a.m. every day. And when I held the next advanced workshop in Australia, the following year, both she and Jim attended. So I remember the first night I could hardly make it up the stairs to our room, which was normal for me, she reported. But by the end of the workshop, I was walking around like a healthy person and I didn't have to use my asthma medication. The day before we left, Jim said I was looking so well, I should try some normal food. Apprehensive, I gave it a go and no adverse effects, no pain, no asthma, no cramps, no headache, nothing. I think it was the best pizza I've ever had. When she did her meditations, Jennifer really gave it her all. She repeatedly tuned into the potential of health and felt an abundance of energy throughout her, throughout her body that could carry her all day long. And in the meditation, when I asked the students to live from that new state of being, she imagined her feet hitting the ground and heard her breath as she joyfully ran. By the end of her meditation, she was crying tears of joy. And eventually Jennifer conditioned her body to forget what illness feels like, looks like, sounds like, and tastes like by raising her energy, changing her frequency, reconditioning her body to a new mind and signaling the genes to repair her body. So now I eat normal food, she reports, and I haven't used my asthma medication since June, 2015. I can walk up to 10 miles a day and I can lift 45 pounds. I'm training and my goal is to complete a half marathon, which I will soon do. Felicia overcomes severe eczema. Felicia had intermittently suffered from eczema and skin infections since she was three months old. The short-term relief provided by a very strict diet and a regimen of medications, creams, steroids, antihistamines, antifungals, antibiotics, and so on, never seemed to keep the condition at bay for long. So in 2016, as a 34 year old medical doctor in the United Kingdom, Felicia found herself becoming increasingly frustrated by the limitations of her profession. After a decade of clinical practice where she'd seen more than 70,000 patients, she began to recognize a similar 
sense of frustration and disconnect emerging from her patients as well. So while seeking more satisfying science-based solutions, she came across my work. So intrigued by the possibility and hungry for alternative evidence-based ideas and solutions, Felicia signed up for a weekend workshop. The event was life-changing, she says. It gave me the tools to reevaluate and update my previous limited belief systems and the beliefs about myself, as well as what our bodies are truly capable of. So the breathing technique was particularly intriguing to her. I must confess, she says, that I remained a little skeptical and held back, not allowing myself to truly surrender to the process. So during the months that followed, Felicia continued to meditate daily and her skin improved and she successfully manifested a new relationship in her life. Feeling inspired, she sought new ways to pivot within her medical practice to adopt a more holistic approach. But to her great disappointment, all the United Kingdom medical indemnity bodies refused to ensure any non-conventional approaches. So Felicia felt trapped. So in December of 2016, her eczema and skin infections returned. So even so, she continued meditating and even signed up for an advanced workshop, creating her mind movie in preparation, which is a powerful tool for manifesting various things you want. So which you will read about in later in the chapter. So she had very clear intentions for her future and included images of her healthy skin, as well as a picture of a microphone on a stage with the affirmation, I inspire others by sharing truth fearlessly. So on the first day of the advanced workshop, we did the breathing. It's the breathing technique to activate the pineal gland. And this time Felicia did not hold back. So Felicia decided not to hold back and to completely surrender to the process. So I noticed my breathing beginning to hasten, she remembers, and overwhelming energy started to building inside my throat. This intensified until my throat felt as if it was going to close up. Fearful, I pulled my body out of this position and returned back to my old state of being for the remainder of the meditation. Okay, I'm gonna pause right here because if any of you have this experience, one of the key things is that while you're in meditation, there's nothing for you to fear. So before you go into meditation, you need to have the mental resolve and the mindset that you're going to surrender, you're going to um, just let go, you're willing to allow what energy, is, however the energy chooses to move inside your body, whatever it is that you see, smell, taste, hear, uh, feel throughout your skin and your body, what, however it chooses to manifest, you're just willing to go for the ride. By being willing to go for the ride, you're allowing, you're not stopping the energy halfway through its work. Because if you freak out, get scared, and like in her case, she decided to stop it. So then the energy, literally, it comes to an abrupt halt and you don't get the benefit of the complete healing. You get a partial healing. She could have been healed that day, but because she allowed fear to come in, she could have consciously in her mind said, no, 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 I allow, I let go. I'm willing for whatever energy needs to me, you know, move within me, whatever the divine has for me, I'm willing to accept, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm open. And that's all it takes. Just say, I'm open and be receptive. And, uh, and that's it. You don't need to know anything else. Okay. So moving on here, the following day for the last meditation, Felicia was being fitted with the brain mapping equipment. She considered what an amazing opportunity it was to experience this new level of information, feeling trapped in a profession that preaches limitation. She had the thought, what if I could demonstrate to 
the skeptic as well as to believers how unlimited we really are. With this thought, she wanted to use this breath to connect to the unified field with an elevated emotion of pure freedom and liberation no matter what happened. So when the meditation began, she opened up to the possibility and to the unknown. She quickly noticed that her breathing started to change and the overwhelming energy began to build in her throat back in the same place again. So each time the sensations intensified, instead of allowing them to overcome her as she had done the previous day, she stayed, she stayed with the process. She returned her body to the present moment, ignoring distraction and placed all her energy and her awareness on connecting to the field, to truth and to love. Her body was persistently defiant, but after repeatedly overcoming her internal struggles, her body eventually surrendered. What I experienced on the other side was an exhilarating explosion of energy in my brain and an instantaneous connection with a loving consciousness within and all around me. She says, it was an absolute knowing, a recognition of pure love. And with it came the most overwhelming emotion of joy that I have ever experienced in my entire life. It was like coming home. I just experienced this deep oneness. All the while I remained completely aware of all my external senses. I could hear the scientists behind me saying, seizure. We had some new members on our team of neuroscientists and they had never seen that kind of energy in a brain before. So as a medical doctor, Felicia might normally have been concerned at that somewhat alarming statement, but she understood that in that moment, she was experiencing absolute truth and freedom for the very first time in her life. So for a few hours following her meditation, she felt somewhat dazed, but physically lighter than before. So if you review the brain scans and graphics 7A and 7C, you can see Felicia's brain showing the classic changes that we witness when there's a high energy in the brain. She starts in normal beta, beta waves, and then transitions into high beta brain waves, and then transitions into high beta brain waves before she hits a high energy gamma state. Energy in gamma brain waves is 190 standard deviations 190 standard deviations above normal. I'm going to stop right here because if you, if you remember from the previous chapter, the normal deviation points above normal usually is two, three, no more than four. And she was 190 standard deviations above normal, which is outrageous. So the area surrounding the pineal gland, as well as the part of the brain that processes strong emotion is highly activated. So during the, the next few days, Felicia began to experience a sense of fearlessness and playfulness emerging from within her. She also experienced a string of synchronicities, of course, including manifesting the scene from her mind movie where she was speaking into a microphone on stage and in fact, without knowing that scene had been in her mind movie, I pulled her on stage to share her experience. It was only once she returned home that she noticed her eczema was no longer bothering her. I looked at my skin and all the rashes that had been there just a few days before, completely resolved, she reported. Look at graphic 7D in the color insert. The first pictures were taken before the event the second set of pictures were taken the next day after the event. Her eczema is gone. So to this day, Felicia takes no further medication and her skin is clear. Her life continues to unfold in new, exciting and surprising ways. And I'm so grateful for the realization that we are all unlimited, she said to me. Mark my words. If a once jaded, intensely analytical doctor can do it, 
Absolutely. Anyone can. Yeah. So that concludes chapter six. Um, I did want to mention a couple things about chapter six because one of the things that happens as you continue to meditate and you're moving a lot of the energy and you um, start to feel energy moving inside of your body. So for example, like on March 22nd, we had, you know, our entire group of advanced students that work with Dr. Joe, we've been coming together on a daily basis to do meditations. And uh, on this particular Sunday, this was March 22nd, we had, we were meditating from nine o'clock in the morning till three in the afternoon, you know, consecutively. And so during that particular day, I actually started at 10. I wasn't, for whatever reason, I wasn't able to join at nine. So I started at 10. But that particular day, I ended up having a profound mystical experience, which was very surprising to me because, I mean, a mystical experience can happen anytime you're doing a meditation. But my intention for the meditation was to broadcast love, the whole idea being to heal the entire planet, all beings, all people, whether they, whether it's an issue of the coronavirus or any other kind of flu or any kind of disease, syndrome, cancer, neurological disorder, physical trauma, just a complete healing in all senses. So that was our group's intention. So the last thing I would have expected was to have a mystical experience during this, uh, during this particular meditation. So that was a surprise. And one of the things that, um, if you've never had a mystical experience uh, before, one of the things that happens oftentimes in meditation is that you'll be meditating and you'll, you'll be listening to the guided meditation. And then all of a sudden, you don't really know what happens, but you're gone. You're not there. You, you not only do you not feel your body, but you leave into another dimension. You have no idea where you are. You have no idea what you're doing. You're just this awareness in the void but in this particular uh meditation i actually have a video that i did on it on the heels of that i ended up sharing that with the group of people that i meditated with and then i was encouraged to put it on my youtube channel so i actually do have it on my youtube channel um, but what happens right after that is you're kind of in a different it's like just because you come back and your eyes are open you're kind of in an altered state for some, okay. time, you know, for some time after that. And so I want people to know that that's normal, that that's fine. That's part of the process. Yeah. You're going to, even though you're done with the meditation and, and you can come back at any time, but once you're finished with the meditation and you're, you're quote unquote awake again, so to speak, you're not asleep asleep. You're just in an, from an altered state with your eyes closed to now you're in this 3D dimension again, you're kind of in a, kind of like a bubble zone. It's kind of hard to describe. And, and then slowly in time, you know, that eventually goes away. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's because your body is vibrating at a higher frequency. And so it's adjusting to that. And then you slowly come off it. So, um, I just wanted to let people know that that's part of the process. And as I mentioned before with this gal, Felicia, who's a uh, doctor from the UK, when she felt that gripping energy in her throat the first time, had she surrendered to whatever the energy was trying to do and move. And sometimes it is uncomfortable. We, you know, everybody's body is different. Everybody- I've had people have headaches afterwards they'll yeah. get a head and they're like is that normal and it's like it's normal for you you know and they'll they'll get a headache and they have just this feeling of they're not quite sure what happened yeah they're like most people don't know, I know it's like i know something happened i i had one um client i was working with and she was battling anger betrayal from a breakup, just all kinds of things. And um, and I normally don't do this, but for whatever reason, after working with her and after doing a meditation, I grabbed my iPad and I said, look at yourself. Now, I normally don't do that, 
But there was something I could see on her and she's, and she almost didn't recognize herself. She's looking at herself and she's like, I look younger. Oh my gosh. She's like, what happened? She's like, I look younger. And literally when you looked at her, she looked younger because she was holding so much negativity within herself that it had aged her physically. And she just, and, and for whatever reason, uh, you know, it came to me, let her look at herself, let her see herself. And so I let her see herself. And, 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 and the odd thing is, I didn't really realize why, because I hadn't noticed that she looked younger. I, I just knew something was there. And so she looked at herself and she's like, oh my God, that doesn't even look like me. And it didn't, it was just, and then after we looked at some before pictures from us hanging out that day, and then some, but after she's like, oh my God, you can even see it in the pictures. Yeah, yeah. so and that's, that's tangible evidence of the energy having moved throughout the meditation and it there were there was obviously blockages in her body and it was let go so that lifts so from a scientific standpoint as we learned in the previous chapter chapter five he talks about as you do the meditations you're not only doing the breath you're holding an intention right and then you add the elevated emotion of love joy and then gratitude Gratitude being the final step because that's how you put the bow on the gift, say the order is complete. And gratitude is the ultimate state of receivership. That's telling your brain that we already experienced this outcome because the brain doesn't, doesn't have a right. past, doesn't future. So we are future mapping. We are creating a future experience that, that we want. But our body and our brain thinks that because we're feeling an elevated emotion of joy and love, and then followed by gratitude, it's like, well, oh, this already happened. So then it signals to the body, this is a new emotion and memory we have to store in the body. This already happened, it's in the past. It's kind of almost like hacking your brain is really what it's doing. Yeah, yes, yeah, absolutely. And so by elevating your emotion and being yes, 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 it's like, oh my gosh, I'm so in love and yes, yes, yes. It's yeah. like, yes, this is done and thank you, thank you, thank you. That elevated emotion fans out your electromagnetic, you know, frequencies and your electromagnetic field. Her field probably was contracted from all that anger and betrayal, all that heaviness. So she was able to fan out her electromagnetic field, which obviously it's going to make a difference on your actual skin yeah. and body. Yes. And what a testament to your being tuned into your intuition and listening to your consciousness because you didn't even know why you handed her the ipad but no. you followed because you were so tuned in tapped in and turned on you instinctively grabbed the ipad and told her here and the rest yes. of the history yes. you know that's one of my intentions for this year is to listen a little better and i gotta tell you it has just changed my life um to listen without questioning yeah. And when that, when these, um, I call them bursts of brilliance, when the intuition comes up, to just go with it and don't worry about anything, you know, and learning not to be an overthinker is another part. So those are like my intentions uh, for 2020. Uh, well, actually, I started in 2019. My year started, uh, well, I'm about a year out of that now. <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's amazing how you, you you touched on the gratitude and when you live in a state of constant gratitude regardless of the circumstances exactly it's amazing what it does for your life i you mentioned in the in the chapter that she was an asthmatic mm -hmm. i have been an asthmatic my life too and I lived most of my life literally feeling my heart beat because I was always so anxious. Oh. I was always having issues with my asthma because of this. So once I was able to let my let let me control this, 
right? Let, let the mind control the body. Um, I'm off of one of my asthma medicines. Uh, I got sick back in February, but I hadn't been sick for two, for two years, but that was only because I caught a bug or something, not because it was just asthma as it normally would. And I got to tell you, you mentioned her being able to walk the 10 miles. I, I can walk. I can talk when I walk, <laughs> you know? And so, and I, I, I really say that a lot of it is attributed to this idea and this notion of gratitude and seeing oneself well. Dr. Joe, you, you see yourself well. I don't see myself. I used to say I am an asthmatic. Now I say I have asthma, mm -hmm. which that may be a, a subtle shift because now I have asthma maybe, and it usually doesn't bother me, right? Yeah, As it's, opposed to, to, it's starting to dissipate away before you know it you won't have it anymore i i, I truly believe that i truly I, I got off of two medicines in 2020 wow. uh, from the doctor and my goal by the end of 2020 is to be off all of my medicines that is fantastic wow that's incredible you know and going back to the the um elevated emotion of gratitude one of the things that um, I want to bring people's attention to, I mean, there's so many clues in our vocabulary and in our words. And we have words like gratitude and appreciation. And oftentimes people don't really take a moment to think, what is the difference between gratitude and appreciation? So I want people, you know, this is a realization that I had about a year, a little over a year ago. And um, it comes from my having a, a background in mortgage banking and in real estate, where you know, if you're, if you look at the word appreciation, when something you something else we have in common, by the way. Yeah. Another thing we have in common. Yeah. I'm guilty of having been a, a mortgage banker, <laughs> mortgage banker and, a, and also a real estate broker. Me too. <laughs> so, yeah. But as you know, when you appraise a home, you, are figuring out the value of the home and as the value of the home goes up it appreciates in value so when you are appreciating something or someone or so or some place that is an act of holding in higher value that thing that is of your attention so that's what it means to appreciate another human being, for example, is to hold them in higher value. It comes from to appreciate, like appreciation in a home, the home has gone up in value. It's actually worth more money than it was before. And gratitude is just, you know, thank you and gratefulness, of course. And so I think it's always important to, to um, use both the word of yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate you so much, divine God, universe, you know, whoever it is, however you want to language it while you're doing in your meditation or just the divine. I love Dr. Joe calls it, you know, the divine. And it's the ultimate state of receivership because it's signaling to your body that it has already happened. And that's why you're so grateful and so appreciative. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, appreciation is, is almost movement, if you will, right? Yeah, exactly. It's it's up. Up. It's and, an upward and, movement. And, and gratitude is, it just is. Yes. You know, God, divine, universe, whatever you want to call it, has given us, you know, trees to allow us to breathe. We are thankful for that. Yeah. We appreciate God, universe, higher, whatever you call that. Mm -hmm. We appreciate that. So we hold that in a higher, uh, that, that being, that creator in that higher uh, esteem. So yeah, definitely. That's a good point to, to bring, that, that, that is a difference. Yes. Yeah, it is a difference. Because I think people think that they're synonymous. And like I said, I had that realization about maybe a year and a half or two ago. And I thought, oh, you know, as I had these different you know, insights about certain words. Um, I like to bring it to people's attention because I'm sure just as I was unaware of these nuances, I thought, wow. And I've, and they've come to me at most of the time they come to me in meditation. And so I thought, wow, this is really quite, 
quite interesting. Our words are powerful. Our words are powerful. You know, we know that um, uh, that life and death is in the tongue, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have to be really careful. And every once in a while, I'll catch myself, you know, doing a limiting belief. And I'm like, okay, well, that can't stay there, <laughs> right? And, and, the there. Is, and, and the thing is, too, is that um, we have to learn to know that it's okay to have that thought. You can be in a state. It's if you it's staying in that state, right? So if you have that thought or that limiting belief or you feel that anger or whatever that might be, it's really a matter of understanding how to switch it. Doesn't say it doesn't happen, but you switch without judgment. And it's all about you don't mull that same thought, which creates that same feeling over and over and over. Again. Which is what happened to the to the people in the story. In one of the earlier chapters, when the um, I think it was Anne, her husband yeah. committed suicide, yeah. and she just she repeated she repeated it time and time and time. And your your mind does not does not know the difference. And so eventually, it started manifesting itself in her body. And it, I sincerely believe that most of the things and Dr. Joe. Most of the things that most of our ailments are really not physical. I mean, I know like if you if you have a lame uh, Dr. Joe, he healed himself yeah. from the bicycle accident. I think you know there's this tendency because in all the stories you go to the doctors and it's medicate, 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 and it's never really addressing the core issue or in my field, I call it the core wound. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's really at the heart of all of this, at the core. And you know, in Dr. Joe's case, you know, he was he, him and I share that in common. Unfortunately, that you know, we were riding our bikes, and he was hit by an SUV. I was hit by an Orange County Transit Authority bus. Mm. And um, so, needless to say, you know, I had a neck injury, I had a back injury, I had a leg laceration, I had a traumatic brain injury, you know, pain, miserable, brain fog, you know, there's nothing, don't wish that on anybody. Um, and his, his was actually worse because he was actually drugged for, I think like, I can't remember if it was 30, 40, 50 feet, or if it was like a mile or two, but I don't remember. I don't remember exactly, but he was drugged for a while because the lady who was driving didn't even realize that she had hit him. So she drug him for a while before she, you know, somebody flagged her down and stopped her. And he ended up breaking, you know, he was paralyzed basically from the neck down and broken ribs and other things. But his main thing was that he was, he had a broken back and neck and yeah. he did Harrington rod surgery because his head could not physically be held by his spine any longer. That's how bad his fractures were. And they basically told him he was going to be a quadriplegic for life, not a paraplegic. That means that from the neck down, he was paralyzed. And even with the Harrington rod surgery, they didn't expect him to, um, to ever be able to walk. Okay. And they just said, at least your head can be supported so you can at least sit in a wheelchair. And, uh, yeah. you know, if, if you listen to his story or read about his story, then he decided not to do that. Uh, and he decided to heal himself that the, that superior intelligence that makes the body and organizes the body and organizes the entire universe, this planet and all the cosmos can probably also heal the body. And, and it took him 10 weeks after his accident, much to the shock and surprise of his doctors and therapists and so forth. He was back on his feet in 10 weeks. Which... We have everything we need within us to heal us ourselves. It's there. We have it. We just have to learn how to tap into it. It's but like... it's there. Yeah. Everything... That's, that's the beauty of this, this work and this, that's the whole message that yes. we can. Yes. Well, and um, the other thing is that, you know, one of the things that I became 
very aware of as I started with his, not just with his guided meditations, but as I read his book, the first, the first book, this was the first one that I bought. And then as I started to do his online training and then in person, you know, when I went to the monastery in Cancun and did his seven day advanced, the thing that starts to become blaringly apparent, at least to me, which in all my time meditating before wasn't as obvious, but this work really is about self mastery. And so just as you were talking about, you know, you have limiting beliefs and thoughts, negative thoughts, whatever they might be. It's not that when you master yourself that you don't have those thoughts. Exactly. You still, things will happen that are going to make you mad. The thing is, are you going to stay mad for just 17 seconds? Or are you going to stay mad for two minutes? Or are you going to stay mad for 30 minutes? Are you going to stay mad for the rest of the day? It's like, because this guy cut you off and he was a jerk. Now the rest of your day is ruined. And now you're spreading negative vibes everywhere just because, Hey, what's wrong with you? Well, this jerk, you such a, what a, you know, what an idiot. How did he get a driver's license? It's like, it has nothing to do with you being at work now and you're the rest of your day is ruined and everything. From one, from one incident. Yeah. You know, from one incident. And so, he said, he, he lets us know, he goes, it's scientifically proven that when, when you feel emotion, if you hold that emotion for anything longer than 17 seconds, you're faking it. So he says, I will give you two minutes to feel mad, to feel whatever negative emotion, but if you're holding it for more than two minutes, and he said that when he was raising his kids, he said, anything over two minutes, you're faking it because that means that you have to keep on thinking the thought to keep on bringing the chemicals into your bloodstream that will make the emotions that will keep you, you know, mad, angry, frustrated, whatever the case might be. So anything mm -hmm. over two minutes, you're faking it. So what does that tell us? So once we realize that you're mad and this is fun, this is another key. You're saying I'm mad. No, you're not. Since when are you the emotion of madness? I'm angry. No, you're not. Last time I checked, what was your, what did your parents name you? They mm -hmm. named you Aria. So no, you're not mad. Mm -hmm. I'm so pissed. No, you're not. You're not pissed. You might yeah. be feeling pissed. You might be feeling angry. You might be feeling mad. But that doesn't mean you are that emotion. That's right. People will say, I'm mad. Do people say, do you hear people say, I'm love? Yep. No. They might say, I'm in love or I feel love towards, isn't that funny? That with love, the most powerful healing vibrational frequency that we can hold. And most people don't say I'm love. They say, well, wow, that's, that's a great point. Yeah, that's yes. And that's, that's the one we should be saying, I'm love. We should be saying, I'm love. Yeah. I am love. But instead we say, I'm so in love. I'm feeling loved by you. I'm feeling loved on. We don't usually say, I am love. But yeah. with all the negative emotions, I'm mad. I'm nervous. I'm stressed out. I'm depressed. I'm feeling, I'm bummed. I'm, you're saying I'm, and whatever the emotion is, as if you and that emotion are the same thing. And that's not, that's a lie. Yeah, well, and I think people just need, sometimes, I find that people almost need permission to love themselves. Absolutely. I love that because those are the exact words that I've been using, not only with myself, but with others. Give yourself permission yes. to completely love yourself. You are yes. worthy of love. You're not being arrogant. You're not being cocky. You are love. And you should give you, you need to give yourself permission to love. And the whole thing about the negative emotions, I always, I always say, it's okay to have a pity party. You just need to know when to leave. Absolutely. Right? You just can't stay there. And so the same thing, but love is something you can embrace all the time. An interesting thing happened. I had a woman staying with me. Um, she was in between homes, so she was staying with me. And one day it was just raining outside. I mean, like cats and dogs, but I love the rain. Because when I see the rain, 
I think uh, God's majesty and I'm going to have green trees. And that's, that's what rain represents to me. And it's sound to, I don't know about your ears, but I love the sound of the, the sound. Rain. Yeah. Yeah. And the look it, to me, it's a romantic time. Whenever you see it's raining, I'm like, Oh, we're having a, I don't know why I think it's a romantic day. Sunny day. <laughs> It's the one morning I woke up and it's raining and I look outside and my very first thought is, wow, it's raining, how beautiful it is outside. Uh -huh. He wakes up, looks out the same window and says, it's raining, what a gloomy day. <laughs> what a gloomy day. <laughs> And it was just a total opposite, right? Because I was all excited <laughs> about this rain. And so I had, I had brought that to her attention. She says, you know, I never thought about that. You know, and she said, and, and so one of the things I worked with her a lot on was watching her language and what she said about herself. Because what I think people forget is when you speak, you're listening. Yes. You're saying it two times. Mm -hmm. You're saying it inside your head, and then you're hearing it say it the second time out your mouth. So you're actually hearing it doubly. Yes, yes. And so we have to make sure that we plant the good seeds and we plant those positive emotions. And when you do, uh, I think it was last week, I don't know, I was having a moment. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I was just having a moment. I was just. Uh, not my normal self, you know, and I was just having a moment and finally I just got to the point to where I just snapped out of it. It was like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, it's like you have breath, you have life, you know, you're healthy, you're well, you know, and so that's what it does. Um, Emmett Scott did this little book. It's, it's a little thin book and it's, um, I can't think of the name of it, I have to look it up, but it's where you have to stay positive for seven consecutive days. You don't tell anyone you're doing it, but for seven days, you have to maintain a positive thoughts. Now, if you slip up and you have a negative thought, that's okay as long as you instantly replace it. Yeah, and you replace it with something positive that you want. Yeah, but if you harbor on it, you have to start the seven days over again. And so this is something you do within and you don't tell anyone that you're doing it. And you have to do it when, uh, you know, you can't do it just, you can't start this anytime because something's <laughs> kind of popping in your brain, right? But I, would ch I always challenge people to do that. Give it a try for seven days straight. You don't tell anyone what you're doing, but just think positive thoughts. And it, I can tell you, it's exhausting, even for the best of us. And I'm pretty high on, po on, on positivity and gratitude. Yeah. Yeah, and the thing is, like, you, like you're saying, we are, because we're human beings, you know, we, uh, one of the things, again, that came to me in, you know, meditation was that as human beings, we come to this planet Earth to experience emotion and limitations. And those are like the two, the, the main lessons are to learn to manage emotions and limitations. And mm -hmm. so as you're managing your emotions and your limitations, you know, yeah, there are times that you, you know, it's okay to get angry. It's not okay to have a rage, you know, have an, um, you know, an emotional rage. It's what you do with, with these emotions, right? What do you choose to do with the emotions? And then um, there, there are two doctors that I study under. One is Dr. Joe and another one is Dr. David Snyder in San Diego. And I, one of the things that I love, and I integrate the teachings of both. And one of the things that, um, that, that I learned to use as a tool that I can help my clients that I guide and I instinctively knew this when I was in my 20s when I first started doing public speaking. And I remember where I learned how to transmute. I didn't use the word transmute. I learned that later when I read Napoleon Hill's book, Think okay. and Grow Rich. But what I realized was it's like I was getting ready to do a talk and I had uh, these Century 21 
real estate agents and brokers. And here I am like 25 and all of them are like 50, 60 and 70. You know, most of them are, there's some that are 30 and 40, but a large number of them are 50, 60, 70. So they're, you know, considerably older, more experienced than I was, right? And here I am going to talk to them as, as a lender, as a mortgage banker, and talk to them about the foreclosure market and about the technicalities and how they can, you know, help their clients and what we can do to help them with that. And as I was getting up to, to start speaking, I noticed that I started to get nervous. And as I started to get nervous, I said, I'm getting nervous. And immediately I thought, I'm not getting ner nervous. I'm getting pumped. I'm excited. I can do this. I'm getting pumped. I'm excited. I'm getting pumped. I'm excited. I'm getting pumped. And then I noticed that instead of having that nervous, uncomfortable, unpleasant feeling of nerves, instead, I was just energized. So now that energy was uplifting and serving me. And then I began my talk and the feedback that I got was, was fantastic. Yeah. But after yeah. I was done, I realized I just flipped a little switch. The energy had to go somewhere and it was an energy that wasn't serving me in the form of nervousness. And by my flipping the switch and I just changed my talk inside my head from I'm nervous to no, I'm not. I'm pumped. I'm excited. I got this. I'm pumped. Because you switched it, right? You didn't, what you didn't do, what, what happens is you did not suppress it. You switched it. I switched it. So then now, the difference. a lot of people, when they, uh, let, let's say they have a breakup from someone, right? Yeah. And they're heartbroken and they try not to think about that person and they try to suppress everything. But it comes out in different ways, right? So yeah. it, instead of suppressing it, you acknowledged it and switched it. And yeah. Yeah. the same thing with a breakup. If you're constantly thinking of someone that you can't get over, let yourself think about that person, acknowledge it, and then switch it. Yeah. And, and that takes practice. And so that's the thing. I think sometimes people... People give up because it takes what you're talking with the, uh, the level of meditation that you're on. That takes practice. Yeah, you just have to do it. Yeah, you have to do it. It's not like you, you, you have to sit down and all of a sudden you can sit and, and meditate for an hour, or 20 minutes. And so, you know, even if, I tell people, even if you can take three deep breaths and have a moment of silence, you've meditated. Yeah. And then just a, just try to let it go a little longer, let it a little longer, a little longer. And before you 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 know you're meditating twenty minutes an hour a day, and so it's just a matter of just again giving. Your, we have to give ourselves permission instead of giving up. Absolutely, and like you're saying, one of the I was just I had a client who was actually in the UK, uh, and she was telling me that she has issues with anxiety. And so I said, you know, the moment you start to feel anxiety coming on, I, I don't want you to, because a lot of people have a notion that meditation just looks one way, where it's mm -hmm. sitting down, owning out, and you're just, you know, kind of right. in a state. I go, that's not, no, there's so many different forms of meditation, and you can do meditation with your eyes open as well as closed, sitting down. Walking, listening to music. Walking, yeah. down. there's all sorts of meditation. What a, one of the easiest, and this is a freebie here um, because, you know, the whole point of this is to uplift and help and empower people so that they have something that tangible that they can walk away that they can use. But if somebody like what I advised to her was, it's like, okay, if in the moment that you feel that you are starting to feel anxious and you feel an anxiety attack coming on, just because you have your hand with you all the time, take your hand and face it towards you and start to observe the lines of your hand. Mm -hmm. As you observe the lines of your hand, notice the color, notice the energy in the palm of your hand, notice the energy in your pointer finger, your index finger, your ring finger, your pinky finger. Ooh, now you feel it moving over to your thumb. You feel it now on the top of your nail. 
that's a meditation. Yep, it is. You felt none of that until you mo moved your awareness and your focus sure. to your mm -hmm. hand. The moment you moved your awareness to your hand, because the brain cannot to think of two thoughts simultaneously, now the attention is away from whatever is causing your body to pull up the memory of the emotion of anxiety coming there. And now your brain is going, oh, we're doing this now. So now the anxiety is going to dissipate. And now you're going, wow, I can't believe the amount of energy and things that I'm feeling. I'm feeling little pricklies and a little movement. I, I honestly wasn't aware of that. And now it's like, how did I not notice that? Just by folk, but that is a meditation. Yes. A little simple thing you can do. If you're starting to get nervous, it only takes what, I don't know how long it took because I wasn't measuring the time, but did it take yeah. 90 seconds? Yeah. Maybe. And that's a meditation. Yeah. And you have your hand with you wherever you go. There, yes, yes. If somebody cuts you off, you're starting to get mad. You're like, take a deep breath pull over, stare at your hand for 90 seconds, pay attention to the feelings. There's no right or wrong front of the hand. You might want to look at the back of your hand just to change it up. Feel that each one of the nail beds, just feel at the energy. Look at your, if you can see veins, can you see your veins? Do you see a pulse? Do you see anything moving? Can you feel the veins moving? Maybe normally you can't, but now I'm like, oh wow, yeah, I can see that that's moving at the same rate of my heartbeat. That and, you, you know, and then something you could do too is a, a real simple thing is think of something or a time when you're really, really happy and get into that emotion and when you're just elated and what did you see, what did you hear, what did you feel? And you can get into that, into that meaning and that feeling and then you can anchor it and you can do your ear or you can tap your head or do this or, or some people do this. And so, and feel that feeling while you're doing this. And then when you get into a situation that frustrates you, if you just do that, you're, you will automatically go into that feeling of happiness. What I do, one thing that I do is I do, I, I anchor, you know, my ears. So anytime I, Anytime I tug my ear and I just did it, you probably know I smile. I absolutely cannot help it. Anytime I'm, I'm, I'm going down a, a road I don't want to go down here, I'll tug my ear and I instantly smile. And when you smile, once you smile, it changes your whole everything, your body. So you can just do a simple like anchoring you know, maybe one morning while you're getting dressed, think of something that made you really, really happy. And then, you know, do something to your body, whether it's a pink to whatever. Like I said, I do the, I do the ear thing. And then every time you get that emotion, if you do that, it, it will dissipate. So there's all kinds of little, you know, tricks. And that's why it's good to work with someone like you, <laughs> someone who can help you with, with, you know, with tricks and things like that. So that you will will know them and you can carry them with you throughout your day, your life, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I was going to bring the whole anger thing to, um, Dr. David Snyder says that sometimes when we feel anger, um, we have different, uh, you know, like the neural health reset that I did with you. And I told you that you can not only use that to, you know, any place in the body that you could point pain. If you can point to the pain in your body, you can remove it through that neural health reset. That neural health reset, you can also use it as a manifestation tool. So let's say you want to manifest, I don't know, a new job. And I'm going to go back to the example of somebody cutting you off and you're like mad because somebody cut you off. You know what? You can take a moment, you can do that neural health reset and the fuel that you have from the anger, you can use that energy because your brain doesn't distinguish the difference between one or the other and you can use it to fuel your manifestation as yes. you reset once you once that's right it's it, that's a wonderful technique to learn to, to be able to transmute and you going what you know a negative emotion into a manifestation or into something that's that's positive absolutely yeah so 
there's so many great tools that are out there. Um, and, and the thing is, is that there, anyone can do it. Yeah. That's right? Anyone that's can fun. do it. Anyone, once you learn these tools, and that's why with me, even in my work, it's like, I hate to see anyone in pain, and I'm sure you do too in your work, because you know, we know, no one needs to ever be in pain, right? No, no, there are ways no. and there are techniques that we can help alleviate pain. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like you can, uh, for, for those of you, <laughs> so you know what we're talking about, I got bumped in the head with one of my studio lights, and Lillian was kind enough to... <laughs> <laughs> to do a, a reset for me and uh, help me out with that lump on my head. Yeah. <laughs> and it works. It works. Yeah. Is the bump gone? Um, it's it's there very little. It's 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 not bothering me. It's 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 like I have to look for it. So yeah. That was a that was a nasty little concussion you had. Oh my God! I I gotta tell you, my whole face I could feel every nerve in my face it was just like I was like oh it was horrible <laughs> that that light hit me pretty hard it did it clocked and, and you know it, I wasn't expecting it to fall either so that didn't no. help yeah you would have you would have gotten out of the way had you known but I'm glad that the, the neuro reset helped immediately and uh, and you I, I I was pleasantly surprised to hear that not only it took your pain but I think you also said that your brain fog immediately was cleared up yeah, yes, the brain fog went away immediately because that was the one thing that was concerning me. And it was like, oh. <laughs> and, and, and the nice thing about that, too, is so that people know that when you have this kind of work done, you're, you're almost, um, you don't quite know what happened. You're kind of looking for whatever that thing was, you know, um, with my client who um she she had pain she fell and she hurt herself and i was working with her and and she's like she's like looking for it <laughs> but it, it, it's like when you help me with my head you know it's like this is what that feels like <laughs> you know it just it's amazing to work yeah yeah it works if you work it so it works if you work it well, i'm i'm glad that you're much better and Hopefully that the rest of the bump will go away, but at least your your brain's clear and you don't have any pain. So I am. You do such great work, and and, you, and it's and it's I don't know. It's just a, I'm just in awe of you, and I'm so happy that you invited me. And I just the energy that you have is just it's I just can't even. I'm I'm speechless, which is unusual. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I really appreciate it. Well, I'm so excited we got through chapter six. I'm, um, it's funny because when I started uh, with the first chapter, I think it wasn't until the second day that I realized, oh, if I do a chapter a day in 14 days, let's say in two weeks, we'll be done to the entire book. So anybody who's reading the book for the first time or the second time, you'll get through an entire book in literally two weeks which is, I think, pretty fast, because like I said, the two times before that I read the book, it took me months because I was studying and I was diving deep into the information and reading and rereading, trying to memorize the different chemicals and the different processes and, and things like that. So um, I think that should be very encouraging for people who are wanting to get into this, people who've already maybe started and they want to dive deeper into the content and, um, and just, you know, get another you know, get with a mentor or a coach like yourself, someone who can help help you actually go through it and um, and also decide, uh, decipher it some. And it's really important to get with someone that is able to, to guide you through it. Well, and that's the number one thing. It's like sometimes there are, you know, you'll be doing some of the work and you'll have questions or sometimes unbeknownst to you, there's tiny little adjustments that you can make or you can think about things in a certain way and boom, a whole yeah. new world opens up to you. And it's a tiny little adjustment, but until you heard that from somebody who's maybe a little farther along than you are, and then you're like, oh my gosh, I never thought of it that way, or is just framed in a different manner or languaged in a different mm -hmm. way. And now you're like, whoa, that made all the difference. Sometimes you'll have a breakthrough right Absolutely. off the heels of that. You're like, oh, or you'll get encouraged 
to do it in a different in a different uh, state of being? Absolutely. It's, I mean, I'm a healer. I'm a practitioner as well, but yet I have a healer, right? We all because, do. We yeah. All, yeah. Every, I, you know, I, I call Lillian. <laughs> I, I call you too. So yeah. that's all because great. we all we all need that third person, that that outside voice. Absolutely. So to help us see sometimes what's right in front of us. Les Brown says something, and I use it, it says this, and I use it all the time. You can't see the picture if you're in the frame. You know what? That's similar to a saying that I have that uh, I'm trying to think. I think Alex Mendozian, a friend of mine, um, I remember the first time he said, you can't see the label of your own jar. If you're a jar, others can see your label, but inside the jar, you can't see your own label. So Absolutely. you can see your label, and that's why we need each other. I think that's why a lot of the ancient scriptures, you know, you have from the Bible to the Torah, it says, you know, um, that as, as uh, iron sharpens iron. Iron sharpens iron, yes. Yeah, so is one man to another. And that's basically telling us that human beings, we can't have a solo experience from birth to death. We need others so that we sharpen each other, we make each other better, we help each other. And um, it's, we're designed to be in community and to be there for each other, so. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me to your- welcome. I'm so glad you were able to make it. Thanks for being on this broadcast. And tomorrow we will be doing uh, one chapter. We will probably do, I think we'll stick to the 9 p.m. Uh, today we did it at 2 p.m. because I'm being a good little girl and I'm going to go visit my mommy and my daddy and I'm going to go have dinner with them. <laughs> nice. Yes. How so, fortunate. I'm looking forward to that. So um, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule from uh, you're in the, what, Indiana. what state in the East Coast are you? No, I'm Midwest, Indiana. Oh, you're Midwest. I thought yeah. you were East Coast. So you're there's, in more, there's more than corn in Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> if you're if you're in the United States, that's a, I'm from what's called a region called the Midwest and in Indiana, and that's kind of this long drawn out thing that they say about Indiana because there's a lot there was a lot of cornfields. <laughs> well, that sounds good to me. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day and we will probably see you sooner rather than later. And um, well, thank you so much. Thank you for a great hour. Mwah! Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.